Good morning to all of you. Today I want to remind you about the complexities of medical world and how difficult is the journey of becoming a good doctor. Every step we walk, there are unpredictabilities and confusions, especially when we need clarity the most at the beginning of this journey. Two patients with the same diagnosis may present entirely in a different way. Two doctors whom you follow and want to learn their approach of diagnosing one particular disease might be entirely different from each other. And it gets even more complicated for students who choose to take surgical specialities. The same procedure performed by two surgeons whom you are following will be entirely different. Tell me truthfully, have you ever seen two surgeons doing one surgery, say vaginal hysterectomy, step by step, exactly the same way? The answer is no. So how do you learn? It's complicated. But today, I have a good news for you. Surgery may be difficult, surgeons may differ in their approaches, but one thing is fairly constant for all of us. That's the God's design, our anatomy. You may be tall, you may be short, you may be thin, or you may be stubby. But trust me, anatomical landmarks in all human beings are more or less the same. So let's start from simple things which are least complicated. First step should be to learn anatomy before you start delving into the surgical portion because anatomy is fairly constant. Once we learn that, then we can try to master or learn more difficult things in surgical specialities, isn't it? I get it. Anatomy is perfect, but it's not so easy to learn. Today, my aim is to simplify it for you. And what I am talking is urogynecological anatomy or the most anatomy for all of us, for the gynecologists and obstetricians. The way anatomy is taught to us needs to change a bit. You will agree with me that most of the available teaching material on anatomy for us is from the abdomen. Why? Because most of these discussions in lectures are either by the anatomist or by the oncosurgeons. I strongly feel that anatomy must be learned the way we see it. In OPD for pelvic examination, we sit at the perineal end of the patient who is in dorsal position. In delivery room, we conduct delivery when patient is in dorsal or lithotomy position. And for vaginal surgeries, which are so uniquely ours, we are at the bottom end of the patient who is again in lithotomy position. So doesn't it make more sense to learn it the way we see it from the perineal side? So come, let's start learning anatomy of pelvis, the urogynecological style. To begin with, I want you to understand two concepts, the pelvic floor and the perineum. When we talk about the pelvic floor, it's like the floor of our house that has multiple layers to support the building. Now, this floor is special. Why? Because like many modern constructions, the pelvic floor is like a two-story basement here. The roof of this basement is the pelvic diaphragm. You all know about the diaphragm that separates thorax and abdomen. It is a single layer muscle partition. Similarly, we have one more diaphragm, a single layer of muscle that separates abdominal pelvic cavity from the pelvic floor or the basement. The main muscle of this diaphragm is levator ani. So try to understand levator ini on one hand makes the floor of 
pelvic cavity or the abdominal pelvic cavity and also it makes the roof of pelvic floor which I have told you is like a two-storied basement. Now imagine it's you sitting at the bottom end of this patient. The first thing you see there is skin. If you remove the skin, you will encounter superficial fascia. If you remove that too, you will enter in one of the basements. This basement in erect posture will be known as deep. But as you are seeing the patient, if you have got a laser fit in your eyes, you will encounter it first. So it's called superficial here, the superficial perineal pouch. If you go more deep, you will find the perineal membrane. On removing this perineal membrane, you enter in the deep pouch because perineal membrane separates superficial perineal pouch from the deep perineal pouch. And can you tell me if I remove the contents of deep perineal pouch also, what will I encounter? Yes, correct. The levator ani muscle or which is also known as pelvic diaphragm. If you have not understood it till now, I request you to please pause this video and repeat it once. The next concept is perineum. Perineum is a loosely used term. Mostly it is referred to the look of pelvic floor as we see it like this. It is a diamond shaped area bound anteriorly by pubic symphysis, posteriorly by tip of coccyx and on both sides laterally by ischial spines. Mind it, there are two triangles in this diamond which are not at the same level. At the base, yes, they both are joined together, but their apex or the apices point upward, anteriorly for the anterior triangle and posteriorly towards coccyx for the posterior triangle. The anterior triangle is called urogenital triangle as it contains two openings, one for the urethra and one for vagina. Now the two stories of basement we talked about are only limited to this anterior triangle. What are the names of these two stories? Yes, superficial and deep pouch, separated by a perineal membrane, which is also a triangular membrane. The posterior triangle is called anorectal triangle, but here there is only one opening, the rectum and anal canal are in continuity. As I told you before, both these triangles share the same base and there is one nodal point in this base known as the perineal body, which is actually the hub of all the structures joining together directly or indirectly from both these anterior and posterior triangles. Now if you have understood this concept, the only difficult thing remaining for us is the perineal pouches, which might be little tricky to understand. The two pouches, superficial and the tape. So let's try to understand in detail once more about these two pouches. So here I have removed the skin and superficial fascia for you. Patient is in lithotomy or dorsal position. Now what you are seeing is the superficial perineal pouch. I hope you could guess it. Now the contents of this pouch are only three muscles which are joined together in midline with the help of perineal body. The green muscle you are seeing here is the bulbocavenosis muscle which is like a sphincter to the vagina. The blue muscle is the superficial transverse perineae and the one in orange or red which is completing these two triangles is the skeocavenosis muscle. 
understanding these muscles or the components of superficial perineal pouch is important for us because when we are doing vaginal repair surgeries, these are the muscles we encounter. And also when you are suturing or cutting the episiotomy, this is the space where you are actually working. If I remove all these muscles which are forming the contents of superficial perineal pouch, where I reach is the perineal membrane. I told you it is just a triangular membrane which is there only in the entire triangle. If we rip this perineal membrane also of that, can you tell me where do we enter? Yes, you are correct. We enter the deep perineal pouch. You can see here the deep perineal pouch, the same two structures or tube of urethra and the vagina are crossing this pouch also and there are only two muscles, the deep transverse perineal muscle and the sphincter urethra or the sphincter of urethra. So it's simple, isn't it? With this background understanding, I want you to come with me where I'll tell you how we are hackers. I'm sure you know about the hackers these days. What do they do? They find vulnerabilities in the system and try to exploit those. Similarly, we as surgeons also actually are doing the same thing. So God has made a perfect design. He has made organs or whiskers and wrapped them with fascia like a nice fruit packet. And then the spaces which are remaining in between because of the different shapes of those organs or whiskers, he had filled it with lot of loose areola tissue to give a nice pack or nice packing to all these structures so that they don't have friction, they don't move unnecessarily. Now what we have had here is these spaces. And I call we are hackers but we are not black hat hackers, we are white hat or ethical hackers. So when we are doing surgery, we don't try to disrupt the organs. But in order to provide proper anatomy and functioning to these whiskers or the organs in the pelvis, we use these vulnerabilities or in other words, the loose areolar tissue which are avascular, does not have any important structures to be disturbed. We use these places to utilize it or do some procedures so that we can provide a good structure and functionality to all the pelvic organs. I am going to introduce you today to nine surgical spaces in urogynecology. If you can understand these, vaginal surgery, trust me, is just a piece of cake for you. However, the disclaimer is that each of these spaces needs a half an hour to 40 minutes class individually. Today, it is just an introduction. First thing I want you to learn is the white line, ATFP or Arcus tendineus fascia pelvis. If you have to choose only one space out of these nine, just understand about the anatomy of this white line. This is the midpoint of the true pelvis where we actually work. So I will start explaining this to you in reference with its nodal point that is the scale spine. You can say that a scale spine is the nodal point of the true pelvis also. Pretty sure I am that all of you while doing a pelvic assessment in labor ward would have felt this scale spine while doing a PD. So it is the same. If you sweep your fingers posteriorly or rather towards the sacrum, you will find sacrospinous ligament. 
and if you sweep your fingers in opposite direction that is entirely towards the pubic symphysis what you feel actually is the white line this entire line actually that start as white line then meets the tip of the skull spine and posteriorly becomes the sacrospinous ligament that is the line which divides the true pelvis into two equal halves true pelvis actually is a 10 cm area from top to bottom or bottom to top and at 5 cm is this boundary or this line you can say it that is ischial spine posteriorly sacrospinous ligament entirely white line this entire line divides this pelvis into an area which is 5 cm above it and into an area which is 5 cm below it so this we call as the nodal point now before we go any further i think it is important to understand a little bit about the muscle levator ani also so when we talk about levator ani muscle there are three parts of levator ani two are simple to understand one little difficult which i want to make it clear for you today so first part entire most part these are like loops three loops of muscles so the first part is pubo rectalis it arises from the pubis wraps around the rectum number one second is pubo coccygeus originates from pubis and comes and gets inserted into the coccyx that is the second part third part is little difficult to understand and it is very important this part is known as ilio coccygeus but it does not arise from this bone ilium it arises somewhere at the level of again the spine and in front of that which is actually the white line then why is the name called ilio coccygeus try to understand so what happens here this is the obturator foramen I, that obturator foramen anatomy is like bread and cheese sandwich one muscle outside here an obturator externus which is like one bread slice and the other is obturator internus like other slice of bread and in between is the obturator membrane which is like a slice of cheese now when this obturator when we talk about this obturator internus muscle actually it arises from this iliac bone and when it comes down it gets inserted it covers the obturator fossa and it gets inserted somewhere here can you see this this is the obturator fossa in the inferior margin of obturator fossa it gets inserted spine in pier margin of the obturator fossa this is the insertion and when it gets inserted before that it gets converted into a facial kind of thing a fascia white fascia and then when it gets inserted in this line this line becomes thickened and also known as white line so that white line if you have to actually see the boundaries or from where the white line is traversing it is from the ischial spine followed by the lower border of the obturator foramen and it comes to pubic symphysis posterior surface of pubic symphysis and this is the part for where actually ilio coccygeus muscle which is a part of levator ani is arising to be inserted into the coccyx i hope you understood now that ilio coccygeus though the name suggests that it comes from the ilium it is not directly but indirectly is arising from ilium why because ilium gives origin to the obturator's internus muscle which gets converted into fascia and gets inserted at a facial thickening which is also known as white line and white line is the origin point of ilio coccygeus so not directly but indirectly ilio coccygeus is arising from ilium hope it is clear to all of you the second space which i want to talk about is retropubic space or space of redzies it is the space we use for 
the management of urinary incontinence either it is birch colpo suspension abdominally or vaginally if any kind of mid urethral sling we are going to put here pubic symphysis is the landmark and the space is just behind the pubic symphysis what is special about this space is that it is a safe avascular space however you must remember that the safety margin here is narrow it is around 4 cm space on either side of the midline anteriorly you know it is bound with pubic symphysis posteriorly is bladder and urethra and on both sides laterally there is external iliac vessel which is crossing here just below the inguinal ligament to get converted into femoral vessels now you can imagine that if you cross this lateral margin you are no more in the safe space if you go posteriorly again you might injure bladder and urethra and again your safety is gone so as i told before it is safe space but it is a very limited or narrow safe space here if you look at the measurements the space is around 4 cm that is the reason when we are operating or giving incision either for birch colpo suspension or if we are planning from where the uh, needles of retropubic tape we are going to bring out we take three fingers and put it in the midline and limit our dissection area or our surgical area in between these three fingers only there is one more interesting fact about this retropubic or space of red zeus that this space is extra peritoneal when the peritoneum droops down from the anterior abdominal wall it makes a small fold and then goes over the dome of diaphragm then becomes the loose fold which all of you know and reflects onto the uterus so this area being below this peritoneal fold is extra peritoneal now what is interesting about this area being extra peritoneal is that unfortunately by chance if while doing a tvt procedure if you injure the bladder here when you are working on this space you don't have to worry too much because this urine is not going to spill and disturb the peritoneal cavity it will remain outside the peritoneal cavity and if you uh, drain the bladder well in the post operative period this urine little bit of urine which is there in the extra peritoneal space or little bit bit leak which happens in the extra peritoneal space is not going to hamper the recovery or patient's general condition next space which we are going to talk about is the transobturator space this is the space which is used for another kind of sling surgeries for the management of sui we call them tvt o tension free vaginal tape by obturator approach or we also call them tot that is trans obturator tapes the anatomy we have to understand here is around the obturator membrane in this diagram you can see that the obturator membrane is painted in green here i want you to imagine a simple cheese sandwich which has a slice of cheese in between and two slices of bread on either side obturator membrane is like a cheese and the two breads i was talking about the inside one is obturator internus muscle and the outside one is obturator externus and this obturator membrane actually is covering the obturator fossa the bony obturator fossa in the trans obturator tape procedure the needle or the tape has to cross this obturator membrane the needle must perforate the obturator membrane in order to wrap around the ischiopubic ramus one important landmark we must always remember here is the tendon or the insertion of tendon of adductor longus muscle it inserts at the groin as you can see here on the other side of the picture the muscle is drawn in green color now this is the standing position of adductor longus muscle 
when we put patient in lithotomy position, it lies at the level of clitoris and it actually forms a gutter or a depression which can be easily palpated. Another anatomical point to be learned and remembered here is the obturator canal, which is diagonally opposite to our safe entry zone for TOT insertion. Now, you have to remember that you don't have the luxury to fiddle with the needle when you are already inside because the obturator canal, which carries obturator vessels and nerve, is diagonally just 3.5 centimeters away from our entry point. Next important space is sacrospinous space. As you will read or hear many times, even I have done the same blender initially, that people say it perirectal, pararectal, osteorectal space, but it is not. This is the space if you sweep your fingers above the pelvic diaphragm, that is the levator ni, the uppermost margin onto the fascia, if you sweep your fingers, you reach the skill spine, which I have initially told you, is the midpoint of pelvis. And from here, if you sweep your fingers laterally, what you feel is the sacrospinous ligament. And this sacrospinous ligament actually is the upper condensed border of coccygeus muscle or the ischiococcygeus muscle and this muscle mind it it is not a part of levator ni but this is one extra muscle which with levator ni is actually forming the pelvic diaphragm if you have this understanding of anatomy then the things become very easy for you now you will understand that why in my videos of sacrospinous fixation i always tell that to approach this space you have to dissect the middle third of the posterior vaginal wall it is posterior and it is at the midpoint in the pelvic cavity so it is easiest to approach it through a midline incision which is given in the posterior vaginal wall in its middle one third other important relations which we have to remember here is the pin structures which are winding around the scale spine. So we always have to be 2 centimeters medial to the scale spine on the sacrospinous ligament. And at the upper border, if we go in the space which is above the sacrospinous ligament, there is sciatic nerve. We cannot afford to damage that. So always remember, whenever you are taking a bite during sacrospinous ligament fixation from the sacrospinous ligament, you have to catch hold of the substance. Don't try to reach the upper border and go above it. You might injure sciatic nerve there. The fifth space here is the uterosacral space which is the space between the two uterosacral ligament and what is this area? This is the area of pouch of Douglas. We use it here for apical suspension as well as for intraseal repair. You know that ureters are in close proximity lateral to the uterosacral ligaments here and the sigmoid colon makes it posterior boundary. As I have told you earlier also, this is just the introduction of the spaces. Every space can be discussed for half an hour to 40 minutes to even one hour as far as the surgical anatomy is concerned. If you're interested, I'll be more than happy to take these individual classes. Though today my objective is just to touch upon those spaces or just to introduce you all to the nine anatomical spaces which are important for urogynecological surgeries. Number six and seven are vesico-vaginal space and recto-vaginal space. These are the avascular spaces which are utilized during cystoseal repair and the rectoseal repair. Till now, all seven spaces which I told you were from the vaginal root or vaginal axis. Now the next two spaces, number eight and number nine, are the abdominal approach spaces. The first one is the presacral space and the ninth one will be the pectinal space. Remember, these two spaces are at the inlet of true pelvis and cannot be reached from the vaginal end. So we have to access them 
only from the abdominal root. These surgeries are done either by opening the abdomen that is laparotomy or laparoscopically or even robotically. Green colored ligament here is the anterior longitudinal ligament which we utilize when we have to lift up the vagina and the procedure is known as sacrocolpopexy. It can be also used to do hysteropexies. One more important thing in these two abdominal procedures or abdominal approaches that they cannot be just done with the help of native tissue as you know that the distance is much much higher here. For both the procedures we have to use one artificial mesh in order to suspend and sustain these tissues. Lot many things I want to teach you about these two spaces and the nitty gritties of these surgical procedures but maybe today is not the best time so I will just conclude with the last slide and tell you what all I told you till now in a nutshell. So in the world of so many inconsistencies, I am talking about the world of surgery, at least be happy that the anatomy is consistent. We must always learn the anatomy as we see it in OPD or in OT. I told you in the beginning, which is a very important concept, that pelvic floor is a two-story floor or basement of the house, which we call as human body. Surgeons, I always say, are the hackers who love to exploit the vulnerability in God's design. But we are the good hackers, the white hat hackers, or always the ethical hackers who want to help the suspension or functioning of tissues without damaging them. There are nine spaces I taught you today, which are usually exploited in gynecological surgery by the urogynecologist or the pelvic surgeons. So I hope this class made some sense to you. If you want to learn about the anatomy in detail of these nine spaces, please feel free to tell me.